so. If you have a Bible with you, uh, if you would turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. If I could set the um, stage here just a little bit, um, just a little background to this. Of course, we've all heard the cliche about the Bible as believers in Christ. Uh, when you read Revelation, you read the back of the book and you know that we win. Uh, there's ultimately victory in Jesus waiting for us who believe and trust in the Lord. Um, and I'm thankful for that. And I know Revelation is a difficult book uh, to understand. Um, it is highly symbolic and uh, uh, there's just a lot that is in it that we just absolutely cannot understand and, and probably won't until it's all uh, fulfilled. Uh, and I believe that as I said this morning that we're approaching that time. John the Apostle was arrested and uh, banished to the Isle of Patmos um, for preaching the gospel. Uh, legend has it that John was boiled in oil and miraculously survived that uh, event. I don't know that that's certain. It's legend. It can't be determined completely. Uh, but at any rate, we read in the first chapter of Revelation where he was isolated from everyone. And I'm thankful that as we read, we can come to the conclusion that John the Apostle was not down in the mouth. He was not down and out. He was not disheartened or discouraged. He said he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And on that occasion, the glorified Christ appeared to him. Um, and he describes the appearance of Jesus as being bathed in light. Uh, he talks about fire and, and, and molten metal, you know, and, and all of these bright and shining things to describe the glory of our Lord, and we're left to wonder what that's going to be like. But I'm thankful tonight, brothers and sisters, that one day we're going to see him as he really is. And the scripture says that we're going to be like him uh, when we see him as, we, as he is. We're going to be transformed. And that's God's goal for our lives as believers, that we be conformed to the image of his son. And there's a lot to take in there about just exactly what our Lord and Savior is like. But on that occasion, the Lord appeared to John and he told him, I want you to write, John, the things uh, which are, uh, the things which have been, and the things which shall come to pass. And I believe as we read through the rest of Revelation, we see... Um, circumstances in the book of Revelation that reveals the past and also reveals the very present at least in the time that those apostles were living but also we get a glimpse into the future of what is awaiting this world um, and, and what the world is coming to Revelation reveals what this world is coming to and uh, ultimately in the very end we know that uh, sin and evil is going to be defeated. The devil is going to be bound in chains and cast into the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever. That's going to be his end. But there's victory in Jesus, you know, and I've got every reason to believe that one day we'll stand on heaven's shore and in perfect harmony with perfect voices we'll sing victory in Jesus together. Can you imagine the sound that that's going to make? A thunderous, glorious, wonderful sound when heaven's choir is fully assembled, when all of God's singers get home and we begin to sing. I heard an old, old story. What a time that's going to be. I'm thankful. I've got a place in that that choir. Um, it's going to be a wonderful time. Revelation chapter 12 is a continuation of this thought. John tells us here, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. 
Let me say here, brothers and sisters, reading Revelation is profitable. Whether or not we get all the nuts and bolts, whether or not we understand all the details in this glorious book, it's profitable. And in fact, God's Word tells us that it's profitable. Blessed is he that readeth, they that hear uh, the, 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 the prophecies of this book. There's great profit in reading this book. If you don't get the details, you get the overall picture. You know, it's important for us to remind ourselves, isn't it, in the times that we're living in, when we're hearing so much bad news, it's important to remind ourselves that there's good news awaiting us. If not here, then, then in, in the future with the Lord. Uh, there's great things waiting us. And so it's profit, profitable to read this. Obviously, this is full of symbols. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives even unto death. And it's important to get that. They love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And I'm gonna stop reading there at verse 12. Peter tells us that we should be sober and vigilant. We should be serious-minded. We should be watchful because we have an adversary, the devil. As a roaring lion, he said, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Brothers and sisters, we know tonight we have an enemy. Um, and we know that this world has been in conflict ever since uh, Satan deceived Eve and, and her and, and Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Their eyes were open and sin entered the world. And from that time on, evil has been present in this world that we live in. Revelation, as I said, is incredibly difficult. And I'm not uh, up here tonight to impress you in any way. But it is difficult, so much so I often hesitate even to read uh, from it in, in worship service. Uh, you know, and I've read wild and, and fanciful interpretations of Revelation myself that just leaves you confused. And sometimes as we read this and you get lost in the details, it can be bewildering. But on the surface of this book, as I said, as you read it, we may not get all the details of what we're reading. But one thing that we can take away from this marvelous book is that evil is present in the world our God has done all that is necessary to provide for our eternal salvation and that victory in Jesus is imminent. 
I mean, it's going to happen. Praise the Lord. You know, we can rejoice in that fact. I know sometimes we fear what's coming on the horizon. The circumstances in our time are disturbing. And if you watch the news much at all, it just gets depressing and discouraging and disheartening. And the more you listen to that, the more you just kind of work yourself into the pits. You know, that's why, that's why Jesus Christ, before he died on the cross of Calvary, he went about Judea and Galilee and, and, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and establishing his kingdom here on this earth. As he began his ministry, he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was John's message to that generation. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We have opportunity to be a part of that. And Jesus Christ built a church because it's not good for us to be alone. We need to come together in this capacity and encourage one another. The Lord sent his disciples out two by two that they would have company and that they would find strength and courage in one another as they face the enemy going forward. The Lord warned them. He said, I've told you these things ahead of time so that when these things happen, you'll know that I, I gave you this warning. This is the way it's going to be. Christians are not going to have an easy time in this world. It's no wonder why the world is so accepting of all other religions except this one. There's no substance to all the other religions. But this one is real. It's more than a religion. It is a relationship. It is a religion because a religion is a way of life. And this is a way of life. And brothers and sisters, we need this fellowship together. We need to come together and encourage one another, knowing what this world is going to be like. Praise the Lord. God has given us a window on what's coming down the road. And one day we can be assured that victory in Jesus is, is imminent. It's going to take place. Obviously, Revelation 12 is steeped in, in symbolism. For example, the woman that is described here that gives birth to the son, uh, to a son, it, it sounds so very much like it's talking about the Virgin Mary, but it's not the Virgin Mary. This woman, the Virgin Mary, she doesn't flee into the wilderness. And she doesn't live for 1260 days or 1260 years, whichever this, these verses are referring to. So these scriptures are not referring to the Virgin Mary. Some have suggested that this woman is the church, but the church doesn't give birth to this one that's to rule the nations as a rod of iron either. What I believe makes more sense, what John is talking about here, what Jesus, what God is revealing to us through John here is that the woman represents the kingdom of heaven. When John the Baptist came preaching, he, he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus Christ began by saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But in a real sense, in the Old Testament, the kingdom of heaven was at hand to them too because salvation was available to them in the Old Testament. Israel and her 12 tribes and the church and her 12 apostles, both clothed with the sun, the glory of God, uh, clothing this kingdom of God. And it's, de it's describing the glory of this kingdom of God and, and Christ. And the moon representing the ever-changing uh, phases and circumstances of the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. Israel went through changing times and they struggled with sin and all of those things. They were carried into, into uh, captivity to Babylon. They were uh, uh, tormented by the Egyptians and all of these things happened to them. And the church of Jesus Christ has gone through those troubling circumstances as well. Clearly, these verses expose the dragon as the old serpent and the devil and Satan, leaving no, uh, no room for doubt of who it's talking about. It's literally talking about our adversary, the devil, here in describing. And I want to tell you tonight, the devil is pure evil spelled with a capital D. Everything about him is evil. He's demonic. He's deceptive. He's destructive. He's devouring. And his, his nature hasn't changed. Uh, the, the, the Revelation 12 talks about war in heaven. Sometime in, in our ancient past, there was war in heaven when the devil was cast out. He was cast out because he exalted himself. Scripture reveals that he exalted himself, said, I'm going to sit in the place of the Most High. I'm going to be like God. And this devil has designs to defeat and destroy God and his kingdom. And that's apparent in this world that we're living in. 
Clearly, the Bible reveals this endless conflict that has gone on between God and the devil, between good and evil, since the foundation of the world, from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to end. It's ongoing now. It's going to continue on out into the future as far as we go, as long as this world stands. This conflict is going to go on. And look, looking back in the Old Testament, we can see how that Pharaoh fought against Israel in, in the beginning, trying to stifle Israel's growth, trying to uh, uh, get the midwives to prevent those women from bearing children because uh, Israel was multiplying and multiplying and getting bigger and bigger. And Pharaoh thought, we've got to put a stop to this. And even to the point of throwing infants into the Nile River, they attempted to kill Moses, but his life was spared. Then we look into the New Testament and see how that Herod, immediately when he learned about the king of the Jews, set about to destroy that infant's life. We just celebrated that holiday, and every year we go over that wonderful story how Herod tried to kill the Christ child, the king of the Jews, but he didn't succeed. And brothers and sisters, this, this continues on as Satan goes forward in, in these verses here. Casting out, the scripture says, a flood after this woman. She flees into the wilderness. And the devil casts a flood uh, after her to try to destroy her. A flood of false prophets. A tsunami uh, of apostate religions to confuse, confound, corrupt. Ultimately to consume the kingdom of God. And yet he fails. Isn't it wonderful, as we read these verses of scripture, that it tells us that the righteous overcome this great adversary by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The Apostle John tells us in his writing in 1 John that if we confess our sins that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and he said and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Brothers and sisters, God is, is faithful. Christ is faithful. Just to forgive us our sins and faithful to give us eternal life. Uh, I think Wednesday night I, I spoke just a little bit about this eternal security doctrine that we love so much. You know when you see eternal security in scripture, you begin to see it everywhere. And just the fact that the Bible says God is faithful. What does that mean? It means he doesn't back up on his word. He doesn't renege on his promises. He doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, uh, God never changes. And he's faithful to his word and what he promises that he's going to keep. And what does he promise in his word? He promises us eternal life. If it's anything less than that, then God cannot be trusted to keep his word. But again and again, God's word teaches us, demonstrates to us that God is faithful to give us eternal life. And we're going to overcome our enemy by the, by the blood of Jesus Christ and no other way. There's salvation in no other. There's no other name given uh, under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said he's the only way that we can get to God and to be saved. These disciples in, in that apostolic time they had a testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, it, it's important. You know, we, we hear people uh, testify all the time. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times they'll, they'll tell unusual, sometimes wild and crazy things of, of how they came to be saved. But you know what a, a real testimony is? It's being able to stand and say, I know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior. When Peter, when the disciples were asked, who do you say that I am? Peter spoke, didn't he? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. We need to know that. that that's exactly who Jesus is. Thomas, when, when he felt those nail prints in, in the Lord's hand, he said, my Lord and my God. And, and Jesus said, Thomas, you have believed, you have seen and believed, but blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. Nathaniel. Uh, when he was brought to the Lord and, and the Lord revealed to, Tha to Nathanael that he saw him under the fig tree, Nathanael knew that nobody was around on that occasion. How did the Lord know that? And on that occasion, he said, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of the Jews. Just because Nathanael knew that Jesus Christ knew all about him. And isn't it amazing 
You know, you can go into church sometimes and sit down on a pew and you know the preacher doesn't know you. And yet, the, the message that he brings is just tailor-made for your life. And as he speaks, he begins to reveal that God knows all of these things about you and your life and what you've been thinking and what you've been doing and what you've been going through, how you've suffered, all kinds of things. God lets us know that he knows us. And Nathaniel said, thou art the son of God. Mary Magdalene, when she heard the familiar voice of Jesus Christ in the cemetery, she just simply said, Rabboni, master. That's who Jesus Christ is. He's our master. He's our owner. He's Adonai. He owns everything. Everything that's in this universe belongs to him, and he's the master of it. Job, way back in the Old Testament, said, I know my Redeemer lives, and that I'm going to see him. He's going to stand on this earth, and I'm going to see him for myself. Praise the Lord. That's our hope, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that we will see the Lord. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Those are testimonies of people who knew God. Jeremiah tells us in the Old Testament, this is amazing, he said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And it's true, isn't it? Sometimes my heart disturbs me at some of the thoughts that just kind of, where do they come from? How do they get there? The heart is deceitful, but it's with the heart that man believes unto righteousness. God changes the heart. Praise the Lord, he does. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Jesus said in, in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Brothers and sisters, I don't feel like my heart is very pure most of the time. But at times, God allows me to see and feel his presence. And I'm thankful for that. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 8, Jesus said, an honest and a good heart brings forth fruit unto eternal life. The Old Testament saints, they loved not their lives even unto death like the scripture here in Revelation says. The three Hebrews stood before Nebuchadnezzar. They said, we know that our God is able to deliver us. But whether he does or whether he doesn't, we're not going to bow to your gods. They put their faith and trust in the Lord and, and they stood firm on what they believed. Daniel was cast into the lion's den with the same conviction of faith. The decree went out that no one should pray to anyone, to anyone, but Daniel didn't change his habits because of a, an evil edict that went out from an evil king. He continued to pray and prayed openly. And they saw him and, and turned him in and he was cast into the lion's den, but he was saved alive. Whether we live or whether we die, we need to keep our faith and trust in the Lord. Amen. The apostles, legend says that they were all killed except the apostle John. They suffered martyrdom. Some of those things cannot be proven either, but we know according to scripture, that many of them were slain. They were not afraid to die because they saw the risen Savior. And I know that that was really something for them to see. But brothers and sisters, tonight, if we know that we've been saved, we have been with Jesus. Sometimes the old devil gets to working on me. You know, he sows seeds of doubt. He's a deceiver of the whole world and he never lets up. He never gives up. He just keeps on coming and coming and coming. That's why we need to be equipped with that armor uh, 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 of faith. 
uh, that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians to withstand in the evil days and praise the Lord, praise the Lord through faith, these men and women overcame in their time and down through the ages of history. You know, the church has come down to us because men and women of faith, they endured persecution just like uh, the Revelation tells us here. The devil casts a flood out against them to try to, to defeat and destroy their lives, but they didn't give up. They persevered. They stood firm in their faith. And that church, the glorious church of Jesus Christ, has come down to us in our time. I'm thankful tonight that Revelation reveals to us that his church is going to stand. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on the rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, she's still here. And praise the Lord, we still have a, a place to come and, and worship together. And look toward heaven, you know, to look up because our redemption is drawing nigh. To look toward heaven and, and, and to find courage and, and faith to persevere in times of great difficulty um, that we're facing in our time today. These men and women of faith, they held on to their faith in the Lord and, and did not give up. And as we read forward in the book of Revelation, we see that God sends the angel down to bind Satan in chains and ultimately cast him into that, that horrible pit. We see the hallelujah chorus gather in heaven. The saints of God there celebrating their victory over sin and, and death and, and evil. And our God uh, revealing those wonderful words that he's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. Uh, there's going to be peace and, 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 and harmony and, and, and joy that's unspeakable in that heavenly, heavenly kingdom. That is our hope. The world's been filled with overcomers down through the years. And looking back to old Abraham, you know, God called Abraham to leave his homeland and he believed and trusted in the Lord and he went out. But the, the pathway that he traveled, it was not an easy road. It was difficult for him, but he persevered in faith. Uh, and, and all of those Old Testament saints and the apostles in the New Testament and down through the ages until our time today. I'm thankful as we look around in, in our time. Yes, uh, the news is discouraging and disheartening, but everywhere we look, brothers and sisters, there are people of faith, just like you. And, um, in, in this world still holding on for God and will be and when the Lord comes back he's going to find his church alive and well looking for him anticipating his coming we read in the New Testament where those people in that generation they were anticipating the coming of Messiah the signs were pointing to it in, in their day and they were anticipating that when, when Jesus Christ was born I think our generation is anticipating the coming of the Lord I'm thankful that we can know that we're ready for that time to come. Overcomers, overcomers. One of these days we'll sing victory in Jesus together with all those Old Testament saints and the apostles and, and, and all the others. Uh, it'll be a wonderful time. I'm glad I'm ready tonight. I'm thankful for that. Harold uh, Brian. Getting my song leaders confused here. Brian. 120. We can't imagine, we can't begin to imagine how wonderful that's going to be like. That's why, as believers in Christ, we want everybody to get ready to go with us. Um, we don't want anybody to, to miss out. God doesn't want anybody to miss out. He wants all to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Isn't willing that any should perish. And thankfully today the church is still alive and well and she's endured such incredible, incredible persecutions in, in years past but has stood firm in, in, in their faith so that come down to us. I hope and pray that God will give us grace to boldly, courageously stand so that future generations will have the same hope tonight. Victory in Jesus.